the tech companies are indicating the labour market is weak. And then the labour market data is indicating the labour market is strong. Which one is it? We'll discuss the countdown to the open. Starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue. Here comes the pain. Amazon confirming plans to lay off 18,000. Fed officials delivering a blunt warning, keeping big tech in the penalty box. Tech's going to take time. Tech had this massive labor boom. It's starting to come off the boil. We're seeing uh, layoffs in tech. Tech companies cutting costs. They're not good cost cutters traditionally, right? They're, they're growth companies. He's probably right that they're not used to doing that. And so they're going to be late on that. Earnings are likely to come down another 15% um, from where consensus is right now. There's a shooter drop on tech earnings. Uh, and we've started to see that. What's risky is that investors are still hugging a lot of those secular growth long duration areas of the market. Valuations have been absolutely crushed. That area of the market is still relatively crowded. We forget how cyclical some of these tech stocks are. We're still underweight tech. We're still underweight communication services. Joining us now to discuss this are Richard Bernstein and Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo. Gents, fantastic to catch up with the both of you. Wanted to go to these two quotes from two tech chiefs and really compare and contrast what they're saying with what we're seeing in the data. This was from Mark Benioff of Salesforce just yesterday. As our revenue accelerated through the pandemic, we hired too many people leading into this economic downturn. We're now facing Andy Jassy of Amazon after announcing plans to lay off 18,000. This year's review has been more difficult given the uncertain economy and that we've hired rapidly over the last several years. Now, when I look at the economic data, the economic data is really strong. When I hear from these tech CEOs, things look painful. Rich, when you look at things, which one is it? Do we have a strong labor market or signs of a weak one? Well, John, you kind of have both. You have you have a very strong labor market. I mean, even the numbers this morning that came out, you know, show a labor market that's not white hot anymore, but probably still red hot or hot to the touch. And uh, at the same time, you've got the tech sector, which is in contracting mode, right? I mean, this was a sector that was in full-fledged bubble mode for a couple of years. They hired indiscriminately, and now they're feeling the, the downward pressure on that. And, and so the interesting thing is so far, and I think the key word is so far, so far those laid off workers are getting absorbed into the economy. We'll see how long that, that lasts, how many layoffs they have in the tech sector and how, how many hires there still are in the rest of the economy. But so far, those workers are being absorbed. Rich, you and I have talked about the excess in this particular specific industry. Chris Harvey, I'd like your view on this. When we talk about excess in tech, sometimes we talk about the last two years, sometimes we talk about the last decade. When you think about unwinding excess in this industry group at the moment, Chris, are you thinking about the excess of the last two years or maybe the last decade? Uh, John, I'm really talking more about the, the last two years or the last two or three years, right? You have what, what's happened is People took a rule and they extrapolated out. They thought, oh, these COVID trends, this is a once in a lifetime issue. This is a secular issue. Everyone's going to be buying online. And so as a result, we got higher, higher, higher. And that's just not true. There, there is cyclicality in tech. We're finding that out. They overhired. In addition to that, we had an interest rate environment that was exceptionally low that, lot, that let a lot of companies in that shouldn't have been let in. And, and now what we're doing is we're we're going back and the strong will survive and the weak will not. And what we're seeing is very similar to what we saw with energy several years ago. Investors are now saying to the tech space, enough with the growth, show us profitability. If you can show us profitability in your younger company, we can give you money, we can invest in you. If not, then good luck to you. And that's, what's, that's one of the things that's going on is people are now rationalizing things because the cost of capital is much different as we go forward in time. Rich, do you agree? Yeah, I think Chris said something at the very end there, which is really important about the cost of capital, that when interest rates were zero or near zero for an extended period of time, uh, the hurdle rate, which is the rate that investors have to consider in making rational decisions, when the hurdle rate is 5%, you have to say, well, I want to get 5% or more out of my investment. When it's 2%, you say, I want 2%. When it's zero... You invest in every silly opportunity out there 
because you're sure you're going to get more than zero. As the Fed has started to raise rates, you've seen all these silly investments, whether it's cryptocurrencies, whether it's uh, tech companies that are way too young to come public, all these kinds of silly things have started to underperform very dramatically. And so Chris's point about the cost of capital is exactly what your finance textbook says should be going on, and it is going on. So, Richard, we've got to work out if this is a moment in time or a new regime. And I know from speaking to you over the last couple of years, you think this really is a new regime. Are you finding that clients are more convinced by that or still holding on to this idea we can go back to the pre-pandemic themes? Right. Well, I think I think our investors are are pretty much engaged with us, and and they agree with us on that. But I don't think that's true in the consensus. I think that there's still too way too much talk about will the old leadership regain form, right? In other words, should you look at this as a buying opportunity in this old speculative leadership? I think that's a very bad sign because it shows that there still hasn't been full capitulation yet in these sectors of the economy. Meanwhile. Other sectors of the economy are experiencing, you know, significant outperformance relative to the overall market, and like nobody cares. You know, you know, you're not finding people talking about why aren't we looking at the opportunities in consumer staples or healthcare or utilities or all these traditional defensive sectors that are actually performing quite well. No, they're still focused on tech and communications and consumer discretionary. They were the winners of last year. So, Chris, let's frame it that way. Do you think old leadership regains outperformance, or do the winners of last year maintain momentum? Um, John, let me let me take a step back and, and, and look at it this way. So what's happened is you, you've taken speculation out of the marketplace, and you should have taken speculation out of the marketplace. Because again, what you've done is you've brought real rates from negative to positive, and, and now those economic models don't make sense. The second thing is what you pay for something means something, right? If you're if you're looking at companies that are 10, 20 times revenue, not earnings. That that those days are over, right? If you're looking at, at growth companies that are trading at a reasonable market like multiple, maybe a, a little bit of a discount, maybe a little bit of a premium, yeah, those growth names can work. So really what it's about, it's much more idiosyncratic. I think it's much more about what you pay. And now what's going to work going forward, we think that the sweet spot for the sweet spot in the equity market is mid cap growth because we're going back into a growth market as we think inflation comes down, growth comes down, and eventually rates come down. But that doesn't mean that you're going to have the high flyers come back in the marketplace. What you pay for something is exceptionally important, and you can find good valuations, 14, 15 times um, earnings in mid-cap growth. Richard, your response? Yeah, I, I would go even a step further. I think the definition of growth is actually changing. I think the global economy is changing. And I think the old leadership was geared to a very to a secular disinflation, lower interest rate type type environment. I think that secular period is over and, and the next 10 to 15 years are going to look very different. So I think that whole definition of growth has to start changing. There's actually data to support this. If you look at analysts bottom up growth estimates for the next five years for earnings, you will find the number one sector for growth is energy and the number two sector is industrials. And both sectors have substantially higher growth rates than either technology or communications or consumer discretionary. So I think that we're in a we're in a metamorphosis period here where the definition of growth is actually changing. Richard, given what you've just said, how challenged is the index story, the S P five hundred, through this year and maybe beyond? Oh, Jonathan, great question, because I think I think that we all know that the U.S. equity market is dominated by the three sectors that I've been harping on in terms of technology, consumer discretionary communications. I think it's still about 40 percent of the S&P 500, take or leave a little bit on that. They dominate the index. Um, I think that's a huge story because the opportunities are in basically everything else and the opportunities are outside the United States. Right. I mean, I don't think people realize that 70 percent of non-U.S. markets outperformed the U.S. last year in U.S. dollar terms. And that's largely because of the domination in the United States of those three sectors that were so overvalued and have been underperforming so dramatically. Chris Harvey, are you on the same page? Um, John, what I would say is we recommend small caps. We recommend mid caps. We think they're going to outperform. So it's not that different than what Rich is saying. And, and one of the reasons why international has performed so much better is because of the lack of tech in many of those markets. And, and the last thing I would just say is, 
last year, it was really what you avoided that helped you out the most. So if you avoided tech, you did okay. Not great, but you did okay. And, and that's what a lot of these markets are doing. And the last thing I would say is, back to Rich's point about where the new growth, growth is, if you look at mid-cap growth, one of the biggest sectors in mid-cap growth is industrials. Absolutely. The other big challenge here is the Federal Reserve. The latest minutes, we were pouring through that just yesterday, and I think this is the quote that jumped out for many of you. An unwarranted easing of financial conditions, especially if driven by a misperception by the public of the committee's reaction function, would complicate the committee's effort to restore price stability. Mike McKee, this Fed is signaling there might be more pain to come. Yeah, John, the thing about the minutes is you can't make things up, but what you highlight in the minutes can put emphasis on something, allow you to spin. Now, we knew from their economic projections, the dot plot, Jay Powell's news conference, that uh, the Fed was going to keep raising rates and keep them high. I think the minutes are essentially an effort to, as I put it, whack the markets upside the head and tell them pay attention because inflation they highlighted unacceptably high, suggesting more rate hikes to come. Uh, no participants anticipated rate cuts in 2023. Nobody's cutting rates. And as you mentioned, the unwarranted financial conditions easing complicates their job. Now, you can see what the issue is that they keep talking about. When you look at this chart here, it shows you what the uh, CPI, less housing, the services part uh, is, and what that uh, compares to in terms of wages. And both are well above the channel that is a sustainable wage pace. Those have to come down, and we're not anywhere near that 2% growth figure. So that's what the Fed is looking at and why they're drawing these conclusions. And it's what we're going to be looking at tomorrow. We got some numbers today, of course, that uh, <laughs> sort of underscore the uh, fight for the Fed ahead. ADP, 235,000, and it's worth mentioning the last five months, they've undershot what non-farm payrolls are. Pay, they're over what non-farm payrolls are. Jobless claims really low. So we still have a forecast of 200,000 and a 5% average annual pay gain there, and that would be above that channel. So uh, the Fed's going to do more work, and they want you guys to know that and <laughs> react appropriately. You guys being the people in the market, Mike, right. thank you, buddy, as always. Looking forward to your coverage of the data and a little bit later this hour and this morning. So Morgan Stanley's Ellen Zetner had this to say about the minutes. Off the back of those minutes, she said this, financial conditions are too easy, reflecting a misperception amongst investors of the Fed's reaction function. As long as financial conditions are misaligned with the Fed's goal, Goals, expect additional tightening. Chris, I want to come to you on that. That line from Morgan Stanley and that line also that's within the minutes, a misperception among investors of the Fed's reaction function. How do you respond to that? Uh, I, I respond to that in a couple of different ways. One, the Fed does want inflation to go down, and they want inflation to go down sooner rather later, and they want financial conditions, and they think financial conditions need to be tighter in order for that to occur. And again, it gets back to the cost of capital. Part of financial conditions is the cost of capital, credit spreads, and so on and so forth. And, and when you make it tighter, then loans start to slow down, the economy starts to slow down. And ultimately, what they want, they've been very, very clear. It's about jobs and wage inflation. And in order to make, to get to their goals, they need to slow down the economy because demand is too strong for the labor market at the present point in time. And they've said very, very loudly, that they need to slow down the economy for a sustained period of time. And so as a result, they need tighter financial conditions. Richard, your thoughts? I think, um, Jonathan, the, um, you know, the Fed, I, I think people who are thinking about a Fed reaction function um, are looking at data that really isn't applicable to what the environment that we're in right now. And what I mean by that is that when, when we were in a period of secular disinflation, there was a Fed put. Right. The Fed could ride in on the white horse and save the day because we were in a period of secular disinflation. And it got so the disinflation got so embedded in the economy that the Fed even started taking their eye off the ball. Right. How many people were complaining that the Fed was talking about climate change and all these other things? Yeah. Well, you're not hearing the Fed talk about climate change today because inflation is much higher, 40 year high. Their eye is on the ball. They have one mission. So to look at the Fed's reaction function over the last 10 or 15, maybe even 20 years, is worthless in the current environment. And I think we have to all understand that the whole credibility of central banking is on the line here. The Fed is going to err on the side of being tighter 
rather than looser because they don't, you know, Fed Chair Powell doesn't want to go down in history as being the Fed chair who ruined secular disinflation. You can so see, I think we should think of the Fed as being very tight for an extended period of time. You can see they are conditioned by the 1970s and the experience there, and you can see the weight of that is something that they carry, and I think we heard that from Neil Kashkari from the Minneapolis Fed. What I hear from you, though, Rich, just going through your calls, you don't think we go back to the pre-pandemic regime. You think the index level is challenged. You don't think this is a moment in time. You think this is a new regime. And, Rich, underlying that, really must be a call that you don't think that the Fed funds rate, even if it peaks at five, is returning to what? Three, two, anytime I, soon? Jonathan, I wish I knew. I have, I have no idea. I'm, I'm kind of the worst forecaster for decimal points that you'll ever find. But, but I think we should think of the Fed as being tighter for longer than people think. However one wants to interpret that, I think, is, is fine. But I think the notion that somehow the Fed is going to revert back to a pre-pandemic Fed mindset, I just think that's 100% wrong. I, I think we're in a new era. Now, I do want to point out that I think that the that's the reason you're seeing volatility, by the way, is that we are entering a new era, and the old leadership was geared for the old, for the old version of the economy. New leadership is emerging now, and I think that if there's plenty of opportunities out there. I just don't think people want to even consider them. So let's fi finish on the earnings call as well. So next week we get CPI. After that we get earnings from JP Morgan. And Chris, if we can finish there, that would be great. Do you think we're overestimating revenue growth this year or underestimating margin pressure? I think we might be under a, underestimating margin pressure. Right? Margins have held up exceptionally well up until this point. We are beginning to see that margin pressure. We're beginning to see volume go down and we're beginning to see the consumer become exhausted. Um, what the consumer has done over the last several years or since the pandemic is they gorged on goods, housing, goods, auto, so on and so forth. They've drawn down savings. They're still in a decent spot, but they're now much more concerned about what they pay for things. Before, there was no price that was too high. Now, price is a concern as people start to look at their finances and say, things are a little bit tighter, we're a little bit more concerned about the economy. So as a result, where we think the pain is going to be, is going to be on the good side, but it's also going to be on the margin side, and we think margins are going to be challenged, which makes it a very difficult environment for earnings. We expect earnings to be more challenged this year as well. Richard, final word? Yeah, I think uh, Chris, Chris nailed it there. Right? The way I would describe it succinctly would be to say that on the consumer side, one should emphasize necessities, not desires. Right. They, that if we if if margins are going to be squeezed, necessities are going to hold up no matter what goes on. We all still eat. That's really the story. Richard Burns, then Chris Harvey to the two of you. Fantastic conversation. Thank you. Coming up on this program, the Pfeiffer speaker continues on the hill. It's not a good look, it's not a good thing. It's the United States of America, and I hope they get their act together. Kevin McCarthy gearing up for round seven. Anne Marie down in Washington, D.C. Up next. not a good look, it's not a good thing. It's the United States of America, and I hope they get their act together. House Leader Kevin McCarthy's bid for Speaker remains elusive. The stalemate now rolling in to a third day following six rounds of voting. What is the strategy going forward? The House scheduled to reconvene at 12 p.m. Eastern time. Let's get to AMH down in Washington. Anne-Marie, walk me through what today looks like. Well, today, really, the question is, has Kevin McCarthy made any progress? And the reporting is, Jonathan, that he has really given up a number of concessions to this group of 20 uh, dissidents in his party, the biggest really being this motion to vacate, allowing one single individual to call for a snap vote of confidence. So 
the two big things, if Kevin McCarthy, what to watch out for is, one, did he make some progress bringing those numbers down? He needs, obviously, 218. But if he does get to the speakership, his position will be incredibly weakened because of all these concessions he gave. The other thing to watch out for is the fact that as he's giving up so much, at what point does the other wing of his party, right, the centrists and the moderates, say enough is enough, and then they start to rebel? It's a very tricky tightrope he is walking right now. So, Amory, are we saying it's messy if it continues and it's messy if he actually becomes the speaker? Yes, exactly. Messy, really, for whoever becomes speaker, because the Republicans have just a slim majority and they have a growing Freedom Caucus that is demanding so much more. We saw this in 2015. We even saw this more so... It really started in 2011, but it is growing to a point that it's very difficult for an individual to govern. And the Democrats are really sitting back and watching this and enjoying this and making sure that they are going to hold their line to not give the Republicans any inch to make this easier. Hey, Mitch, I've got about 20 seconds with you. Can you talk to me about alternatives? And are the Republicans that are mm -hmm. voting against McCarthy, are they presenting any? Well, there's obviously a few names being thrown around. Steve Scalise, who is McCarthy's number two, is one of those individuals. Does the math add up for him? Potentially it could for some of these never Kevins, the likes of Lauren Boebert, the likes of Matt Gates, who say they will never vote for Kevin McCarthy, and it's become a little bit more personal. Then these these dark horse candidates, Jonathan, like Patrick McHenry, but these individuals at the moment are saying they do not want to touch this gavel, and they are really throwing their support to McCarthy. The drama continues down in D.C. And, Marie, I know you'll be on top of the story through today for us on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio. Seven minutes away from the opening bell, futures down eight-tenths of one. Coming up the morning calls and later, Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson warning about a nasty earnings recession. More on that with City's Kristen Biddley around the opening bell. Equities down. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Bank of America downgrading Ali Financial to underperform, cutting shares by two notches with rising rates, softening demand for loans. Piper Sandler downgrading Nordstrom to neutral, expecting a volatile environment to weigh on the consumer. And finally, Jefferies upgrading Oracle to buy. Alice Brent Phil expecting software stocks to outperform in the second half of the year. That stock is up by four tenths of one percent. Up next, more behind the man with the call. The Jeffries analyst Brent Thill on the growing list of big tech layoffs plus City's Kristen Biddley making the case for defence in 2023. Twenty-three seconds away from the opening bow this morning. Good morning to you all. Equity futures lower by six tenths of one percent. The labour market data is still okay. Going into payrolls tomorrow. Nasdaq futures down by three quarters of one percent. Equities down. Guess where yields are? They're pushing higher. There's the opening bow. Take a look at the bond market now. On a ten-year, yields up through most of this morning. Up eight basis points now on a ten-year to three seventy-six sixty-nine. Up more so on a two-year yield in the FX market. Dollar strength off the back of that. Euro dollar one hundred five fifty. We're negative a half of one percent there. And starting 23 with a bang in the commodity market, WTI down by more than 9% or so in the crude market over the last couple of days. This morning trying to bounce and just about holding on, up four tenths of 1% on WTI, $73 and about 13 cents. About 20 seconds into the session, we're down a half of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down seven tenths of 1%. One stock to watch at the open, you know the name, it's Amazon. The tech giant laying off more than 18,000 jobs. The CEO, Andy Jassy, writing in a memo to staff, this year's review has been more difficult given the uncertain economy and that we've hired rapidly over the last several years. Abby has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, one question that is really developing here was I suppose that there are a couple of questions, one of them being what you were talking about before with Richard Bernstein and Chris Harvey, the idea of the strength, the continued strength, solid job market, but with this weakness in tech. But another one is how do we have some of the world's best management teams having overhired so much? Because, of course, Salesforce yesterday uh, said the same thing, similar to Andy Jassy, uh, talking about the difficult environment. But really that overhiring, it seems as though the Fed liquidity excess ballooned right into some of the best tech management views, that excess, huge growth in hiring, and now Amazon joins the uh, increasing pool of these tech
tech companies cutting 18,000 workers, as you just mentioned, uh, out of uh, jobs from Amazon soon. And they seem to be at the higher level, the corporate level, so probably to help uh, the profit margin. Now, interest rates at 0%, as you were talking about, again, with Richard Bernstein and Chris Harvey in that great conversation, the cost of capital, it seems as though it's even given management teams the idea uh, that there's not so much risk out there. And there's that expansion uh, in the job growth for Amazon uh, over the last roughly 10 years now starting to stabilize. The question is, how much does it come in on those quote unquote silly investments that 0% uh, can allow for? We will find out as the future goes on, but it's not just online internet pandemic thinking. Take a look at the fact that it's also uh, Salesforce, which that's enterprise software, Uber, uh, and even Cisco, the old school uh, uh, tech company, John, cutting jobs right across. So let's see who else joins this list at this point, but lots of interesting questions arising uh, from this dynamic. Abby, thank you. That stock is down six tenths of 1%. We'll continue this conversation coming up shortly. Brent Thill of Jefferies, don't miss that in about 10 minutes from now. Retail really feeling the pain. Bed Bath & Beyond coming out with a bankruptcy warning this morning. The stock's down 22%. The stock plunging as the company's recurring losses and negative cash flow cast doubt over its ability to continue. Kaylee has more. Hi, Kaylee. Hey, John. Yeah, this is absolutely brutal for Bed Bath & Beyond. The actual quote from the statement is that there is substantial doubt of its ability to continue as a going concern. So it is considering a number of options here, including potential asset sales, debt restructuring, reducing business, and yes, ultimately even filing for bankruptcy. But another quote, they said these measures may not be successful. So that is why you are seeing this stock punished so brutally this morning. And of course, Bed Bath & Beyond has been having difficulty with its fundamental business for some time. It has seen five consecutive quarters of declining sales growth to the tune of 20% or more. And in all but six of the last 20 eight quarters same store sales have deteriorated they have had a difficult time turning things around they bought brought in a new ceo sue gov after mark triton departed and they're attempting a strategic shift away from some of its private label lines toward national brands but the problem is a lot of those brands who they want product from actually weren't even willing to supply them because they were so concerned about the financial health of this company and their ability to get paid. Plus the fact that the debt has been trading at distress levels for some time, pretty foreboding signs for this retailer. And all of this is made more interesting, John, by the fact that this was a retail favorite stock, retail traders, that is, a big part of the mean stock boom two years ago. At its high in January 2021, it was trading north of $50 a share. This morning, it is south of $2 a share. So this is just a stunning example of the fact that the era of free money is over. The fundamentals matter once again, and the fundamentals for this company, John, are not looking good. Brutal, ugly, stocks down 23%. Kelly, great work as always. Biggest one day drop going all the way back to August. That just gives you an idea of how tough things have been for this name over the last couple of years or so. Looking ahead to earnings season, really kicking off next Friday with JP Morgan. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson painting a very ugly picture. We're gonna get a nasty earnings recession. And so the companies that can deliver on the cost efficiency are the ones that are going to continue to perform until you fully price, you know, whatever this downturn on earnings are going to be. City's Tristan Biddley looking for a double digit downside. She writes the following corporate earnings are likely to fall 10%. We have not yet seen the impact of the financial tightening on earnings. We will see that in 23. I'm really pleased to say that Kristen joins us right now. Kristen, is it too early to expect to hear those kind of things from some big names from the S&P 500? in the next couple of weeks? I don't think it's too early. I think we're going to see the start of it within Q4 earnings, and that's going to be a theme throughout 2023. This shift from what was 2022, focusing on inflationary pressures, those companies with durable demand of being able to pass this through to um, consumers, to now all of a sudden looking at the impact on growth. And so in 2022, we really only saw maybe two sectors focus on this. It was financials who talked about loan loss reserves, growing credit card balances, and the retailers. And I think this is going to start to spill into other sectors, which is why we're calling for an earnings contraction of upwards of about 10%. So what I also hear from you then, Kristen, is you don't think we've seen the lows in this equity market over the last 12 months? Unfortunately, if you're in the camp that we're going to see a recession, equity markets have never bottomed before a recession has officially begun. We've never seen that throughout history. And so that is something to keep in mind. The other thing, too, is when we talk about what's being priced into markets, I know we're talking about 2022 being an awful year with the S&P 500 being down over 18 percent. But if we look at the trend over the past three years, the S&P 500 was up 
over 30% in 2019. It was up 18% in 2020 and nearly 30% in 2021. So some of this is mean reversion in terms of the exogenous behavior that we saw in supply chain shocks in COVID. And so a true recession and a true earnings contraction is not priced in here. So Kristen, Richard Bernstein was on the program a little bit earlier from RB Advisors in the last 30 minutes or so. And he thinks this index story on the S&P 500 is gonna be challenged for quite a while because of the weighting to growth companies, the weightings to these big mega cap tech companies. Do you agree with that then? I would agree with that. I, I think the, the challenge that we have is, you know, we always say don't fight the Fed when there are easy monetary conditions. We have to follow that sage advice when there's tightening financial conditions. All of the data that we're getting, whether it's the commentary out of the Fed or the data around um, the, the, the jobs and employment picture is telling us that they're going to continue on this tightening path. And so ultimately, I think that is something that we don't want to be in a position where we are we are investing in companies that are reliant upon very low interest rate environment or don't have the balance sheet or experience or leadership to be able to navigate these tighter financial conditions, which we expect for quite some time. Well, let's talk about leadership decisions right now. Mark Benioff over at Salesforce, 10% of the workforce is going to go. Andy Jassy over at Amazon, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, 18,000 jobs are going to go. At what point does that start to become good news for some of these names, some of these stocks, and for the industry more broadly that is starting to push harder on, on costs? So we saw this about midway through last year, right, that we saw a lot of tech companies start to announce recession plans, start to talk about layoffs. I think the interesting thing when we look at the overall employment picture, though, is you have to say what, so technology, for example, represents more than 20% of the market capitalization of, of U.S. equities. However, it's only about 2 to 3% of the labor force. And so when we start to look at areas where we could see substantial job losses, we're actually looking to parts of the economy like residential construction. So housing was a big story in 2022, where you saw new home sales, resales decline by 30, 40 percent. However, when you saw new housing starts, they only declined by a, by a couple of percentage points. This is an area when you're talking about tight financial conditions, where you're going to put capital to work, where we expect almost a, a loss of upwards of about 300 to 500,000 jobs. And so we have to look kind of at the sector and exposure when it comes to the overall labor force as to where we're really going to see that flow through into the job data. And Kristen, also draw a distinction between what you think is about to happen with the economy and what's happened in the market already. Home builders last year, ugly, almost as soon as we kicked off 2022. So with that in mind, Kristen, can you help me understand where you think there are parts of the market that are further along in the adjustment process where you actually think there might be some opportunity. I, I think that ultimately we're still pretty, as I mentioned earlier, we're still pretty defensively positioned. And so that's why we continue to be overweight fixed income. We, we believe that even within fixed income, we haven't seen credit spreads blow out. So even within our positioning there, we're still invested in quality. We like municipal bonds. We like preferred stocks um, at this level with financial issuers. And then on the equity side, we're still pretty defensively positioned, John, to be, to be honest. Um, we are looking towards those sectors like healthcare, global pharmaceuticals, those sectors that have been, been resilient and able to grow their earnings through the past four recessions. So healthcare is a great example, an 8% earnings growth. So we're sticking with that playbook. Kristen, just term. finally, on the bond market, you mentioned that. And excuse me for jumping in, but this move this morning, up 12, 13 basis points on the front end on a two-year to 448 on a 10-year, up eight basis points to 377. Kristen, what do you make of that move this morning off the back of some pretty resilient labor market data in the last 24 hours? I think we're going to see continuing to see some of that volatility around the front end. And that just goes back to the market looking for whether there's some dovish signals or some hawkish signals. So that good news in terms of the resiliency and in terms of some of the jobs data is obviously influencing that movement. And basically, the market's anticipating a more hawkish message from Powell next Tuesday. And unless we start to see some of the breaks either in a material decline in the trend in inflation or a break in employment, as I mentioned, areas like residential construction, the market is going to anticipate that you're going to still see that strong curve inversion and some pressure on the front end of the curve. Payroll's coming up tomorrow morning. Kristen, thanks for jumping on with us. Appreciate it. As always, Kristen Bidley there on the latest in this market, latest in the bond market, big moves. Your yield curve, two tens, negative 71 basis point. The two-year up 12 or 13 basis points. The 10-year up by about eight or nine off the back of that economic data earlier. The equity market, 10 or 11 minutes into the session, down by more than 1% now on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, down by 1.4%. Coming up, Amazon joining the growing list of tech companies cutting jobs. The big challenge for Amazon in the third quarter wasn't that their e-commerce was slowing. 
It was that their higher margin, higher growth, cloud computing and advertising business were starting to feel the negative impact of a challenging macroeconomic environment. That conversation up next with Brent Thill of Jefferies. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, former Central Bank of India Governor Raghuram Rajan. That conversation at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. The big challenge for Amazon in the third quarter wasn't that their e-commerce was slowing. It was that their higher margin, higher growth, cloud computing and advertising business were starting to feel the negative impact of a challenging macroeconomic environment. So to the extent that you consider to see more weakness, then 10,000 could become 18,000, could become 30,000. Uh, we'll see how they continue to manage costs. Another sign that the tech slump is getting worse. Amazon slashing more than 18,000 jobs and a cutback aimed at the corporate ranks. Brent Thill of Jefferies keeping his buy rating on the stock with a 135 price target. Brent, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Brent, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. It's been a while. Let's just start with this, and it's a question that I think has come across my desk, maybe yours, several times over the last 24 hours. It's a company of 1.5 million people. 18,000 jobs doesn't sound like a lot. It's not a lot. Why is this significant? Well, I think it's a step in the right direction. To your point, it's a rounding error. It really doesn't have a, a meaningful impact. On, on a corporate side, obviously, their corporate headcount is, is a lot lower. So maybe 1% of the overall headcount, but maybe closer to 4 to 5% of, of corporate headcount reduction. So if you look at Salesforce.com, Elastic, number of software companies, they're laying off 10 to 15% of their headcount. So it's been pretty consistent across tech. Uh, so this isn't shocking. The magnitude should probably be higher. It may end up being higher. Uh, Jeffries is forecasting a more prolonged uh, recession and a later start to the recession, which is bad news, meaning this just gets dragged out potentially e even into 24. So that is the scary news of this whole thing, that this is probably the tip of potential layoffs in, in the tech industry. We, we've seen, again, a pretty massive hit uh, to the to the to the industry, uh, but I think based on what we're we're seeing and our economists are predicting that this may end up being uh, continued bad news at least through the first half of 23. So, Brent, this is super difficult to do, I know, but what kind of numbers are you thinking about? This is a company that added what a million jobs over three years or something like that. What kind of numbers reductions do you think are in store here? I mean, it's hard to say, you know, a company with 1.5 million they, <laughs> employees, they've said this, that they have overbuilt capacity, capacity in a massive way. And I think I go back to Andy Jassy is a software individual. Software individuals believe in high margin recurring revenue. They don't believe in taking risky bets all over the place. I think it's in his core DNA, in my opinion, having talked to him, that uh, as a software uh, investor for the last 20 years, I believe he believes in high recurring, high visible, high revenue uh, uh, revenue streams. And so if you believe that, I would expect he's going to take harder action on things like hardware, on lower margin products, and shift back to AWS and all the other uh, categories that are producing incredible profitable returns uh, and away from flying drones and away from all the experimental things that they've done. Yes, they want to innovate. Yes, they want to stay in the bleeding edge of of building uh, interesting technology. But I, I do think uh, that that maybe perhaps what happens here, especially with his arrival, is he leans back into these other businesses. So I think you're going to see the lower margin businesses get hit harder and the higher mid businesses uh, be, be less uh, imp impacted. But clearly, you know, all the high margin businesses of advertising cloud are, are under duress, too. So. Uh, I, I expect, uh, again, I don't think this is the last uh, cut uh, across tech. I don't think it's the last cut at Amazon. And even if you look at Salesforce.com's cuts last uh, yesterday, you know, they were pretty clear that this may not be the last one, that this is going to be a theme of producing good growth with profitability. Tech has been in a mode of just growing at, at any cost, and that game is over. It is about doing it in, in a responsible, profitable way. Investors won't tolerate it. 
uh, going forward. And so that just means there's going to effectively have to be more expense trims. It may not be headcount reduction, but it may be things around stores, warehouses, uh, additional uh, capacity that they're building out that that may, may, may we may see the cut uh, there uh, as well. So Brent, there's two things going on here. We've got the discipline of 4% interest rates on the one side. And then on top of that, Brent, I can hear that you and the team are wrestling with this cyclical test that these tech companies are going to face, maybe in a way that they haven't in a long, long time, and for some names, if ever. <coughs> Brent, can you put some numbers on it and help me understand what that's going to do to, say, growth in e-commerce and even for AWS going forward from here? I think the consumer's weaker. Uh, you're seeing this, and that's going to have an impact on on items. We're still going to buy basic goods for our house from Amazon, but you know, effectively buying the the four hundred dollar Lego set or uh, buying you, you know the, the, the all the other things that maybe are, are not necessarily required. We're going back to a must have versus need uh, want to have, and so I think that's going to put weight on the consumer. I think you're seeing this across the board. We lowered our numbers on AWS. And on Azure uh, this morning, mega cloud hyperscaler growth is slowing. Uh, advertising growth is going to slow because the first thing that companies do in an economic recession is turn their advertising dollars off. So I, I think we're, again, this is across tech. In the front half of the year, we're in for another reset of numbers. And hopefully we get reset enough so that we can actually start to create a bottom. I think we've cut numbers six or seven times on Amazon we haven't raised numbers in, in a year and a half. And again, part of this is created because of the pandemic. The pandemic created such a pull forward that uh, you're, you're digesting this pandemic pull forward. And then unfortunately, that, that pull forward uh, then ends up meeting a recession, which is a double whammy. Yep. And, and that's the hard thing right now. So, Brent, here's so the, bigger, we're still in the bigger challenge. And forgive me for jumping in. It's 135. 135 as a price target is, what, 60% upside from here. And you talked about maybe things going better in the second half. Brent, they need to be a little bit better than that, don't they? They need to be great to get to 135. How do we get there? Yeah, I mean, tech investors have to take a multi-year view right now. The economy is getting worse. Uh, again, we're potentially going into a recession. Uh, and so what we've said is, you know, is that tactically we've been very bearish on tech, but, but these are phenomenal great franchises and this is a great opportunity for longer term investors we're going to come out of this the question is is it 2024 or is it 2025 and ultimately again our house view is that this recession starts later and it's potentially longer that is scary uh and from that perspective uh again nadella said this at microsoft yesterday to an indian uh news outlet that it could be two years before the next tech boom and that's Nadella, who's yep. the most honest, upfront person on the planet. So that, that to me, you know, again, you have to take that into context is, is for long-term investors, these are incredible franchises. Amazon's durability franchise in AWS, they are the 800-pound gorilla, and no one's even close to them in cloud computing. I mean, it, 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 Google and Microsoft market share combined, there's $15 billion of delta between, between the two combined market share. Amazon's so far ahead. So this is a great long-term franchise. But again, I, I think we have to stick with our clients are in energy, healthcare, out of equities, in other uh, vehicles, and that's okay. And so, like the storms coming through, I'm in San Francisco. There's a storm coming through San Francisco right now. Hunker down. Don't don't try to fight it. And I think that's the advice we've been saying is don't fight it in the front half. Let the numbers come down. Let the companies cut the numbers. They haven't been in front of the puck. They need to get in front of the puck, and they need to cut numbers and cut headcount more. Once they do that, you've cleared the deck. Multiples have compressed. So the good news is all the multiple compression is in. A lot of these multiples have been severely impaired. And so we need the companies to cut. We need us to stop talking about how bad it is and the companies to say how bad it is. Yep. And then and then investors will come back. But until they do that, they're not coming back into the, into the, into the tech pond. Hey, Brent, it's a super difficult moment. And by the way, stay safe on the West Coast as well. Brent Thill, been too long. It's great to catch up. What a difficult moment for some of these names. Coming up, your trading diary from New York. This is Bloomberg.